Jesus, we come before you today. Lord, and we've come to magnify you today. We've come to make your name great, Father. We've come to declare that there is still a people in Stockton, California that knows that you are great, that you are mighty, that you are powerful, Lord God. Today, your people will praise your name, oh God. We will shout to the heavens. Uh, we will lift our hands. We will stomp our feet, God, and give you the praise that you deserve uh, today. Have your way, God, in this service, Lord. Uh, I pray your spirit would move, God, uh, from pew to pew, God, and even to every individual uh, that's listening to this online, God. May the anointing of the Holy Ghost uh, be poured out uh, as we praise you, uh, as we lift our voices to you, God, to send down on us in the name of Jesus. Anybody feel the Holy Ghost this morning? I don't know about you, I feel the Spirit of God. I feel the power of God moving all over us. Hallelujah. One more time, let's lift our voice and praise Him and give Him glory today in all that we do. Praise the Lord, church. Can we sing this simple song together? Sing, I heard. I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How He gave His life on Calvary To save a wretch like me I heard about His groaning Of His precious blood's atoning Then I repented of my sin And won the victory Oh, say victory
we sing that together? Oh, say. One more time, if you're glad to be in the house of the Lord, can you lift up your voice this morning? Come on, clap your hands. Come on, let's sing this together. Sing our God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God.
and lift up praise to a victorious God, a mighty God, a powerful God this morning. Come on, lift your voice right where you're at. And just continue to call upon Him right now. No weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't breathe it. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. Sing that for the There's power. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Yeah. Every war he wages, he will win. Sing, I'm not backing down. I'm not backing down from any giant. Because I know how this story.
up praise? Can you lift up worship to him tonight? Hallelujah. Yeah. Let's give the Lord a shout of victory this morning. That's it, somebody. There's joy in the house. That's it, someone. There's joy. There's victory in the house of God today. Hallelujah. 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 Our God has all power. There's nothing, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. And so this part of the service, we're going to come together in the spirit of unity. All those of you that are watching online, those that are here today, we're going to pray with one mind and one accord. We're going to pray for this city. We're going to claim Stockton as the territory of Almighty God. We're going to plant a flag in the spirit. This city belongs to God. We're going to pray for our nation. Don't give up on America. Don't give up on our nation. Don't you give up because we have a God who can do all things. Would you step on the battlefield in the name of the Lord Jesus? In the name of the Lord Jesus, your kingdom come, your will be done in Stockton as it is in heaven. God, you have planted this church in Stockton with a mission and with a purpose. And we pray with boldness and authority in the Holy Ghost right now. We speak to the north and we speak to the south. We speak to the east and we speak to the west. And we command you to release the souls that are prepared for God's harvest. We call every prodigal son home. We call every prodigal daughter home. God, do the work in this city. Give us a mighty outpouring of the Spirit. And God, do it in our nation, a nation that is divided. Bring America back to you. God, touch our president. Fill him with your Spirit. God, do a work in Congress. Do a work in the Supreme Court. Do a work across this land. Let righteousness prevail. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, there is nothing too hard for you, God. Let's clap our hands because we know he's a prayer answering God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And today, if you have a need in your life, perhaps you're watching online and, and your body is racked with sickness or there's a financial situation, you're here today and you have a need in your life. We often say it this way, not to minimize the need, but we say to exalt the greatness of our God. This is what we say. We say it doesn't matter what the need is. It really doesn't matter whether it's big or it's small. Because our God, he is so big, he can can conquer anything that stands before you. Our God has the power. And he is so filled with love for you that he'll step in and he'll work on what someone else would say is a small situation, it matters to God. It absolutely matters to God because he cares for you. So if you have a need today, we simply ask if you would raise your hand across this sanctuary. If you raise your hand, those that are watching right now, raise your hand. It's a declaration of faith. It's a statement of faith. God, I believe. I'm going to raise my hand in your presence. I believe you're going to meet this need. And let's pray right now for God's healing to be released among this congregation. Let's pray for God's financial blessings, God's protection. In the name of the Lord Jesus, God, you see every hand that is raised today. You see, God, our congregation throughout this city and in this building. God, we ask you to do the work that only you can do. We ask for you to heal. We ask for you to to bless. We ask for you to strengthen. We ask for you to restore. God, we ask for you to provide. You are our way maker. You are our miracle worker. There is nothing too hard for you today, God. So we put all of our needs in your hands. We cast all of our care upon you because you care for us. You are great. You are mighty. There is nothing too hard for you, God. We put our needs in your hands today in Jesus' name. One more time across this sanctuary, let's offer thanksgiving as a statement of faith. That's it. Send up your faith right now. God's going to do what we've asked him to do. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. It is time.
for our Sunday morning tithe and offering. Now it says in verse 1, it says, And when King Arad the Canaanite, which dwelt in the south, heard tell that Israel came by the way of the spies, then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. And Israel vowed a vow unto the Lord and said, if you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their city. And the Lord hearkened, here we go again, that somebody prayed and God heard their prayer and God answered their prayer. You see, it's so prevalent in the Scripture. People pray God hears, God answers. And then we go to another story. People pray, God hears, God answers. Then we go to another story. People pray, God hears, and God answers. And then we go to another story. And people pray, and God hears, and God answers. If you took your Bible in Genesis and read through Revelations, you would find hundreds of different situations and different stories where somebody prayed, there was the one God in heaven that heard, and then he answered their prayer. It is the theme of the Bible is God's people recognize their insufficiency, call on a God that is all-sufficient, and an answer comes to the rescue. This is how God operates. And so we find in this story the exact same principle happening. These people, they prayed. They made a vow. They said, God, you do this, and you do this for us, and, and we'll do this. And God hearkened to the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites and they utterly destroyed them and their cities, and he called the name of the place Hormah. And they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. <clears throat> Let me read that last part of that verse. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Verse 5, And the people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of, the, out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loathe this light 
bread. So, I want to talk to you about discouragement, what discouragement is, how discouragement comes, how it affects us, how we respond to it, uh, the dangers of staying in a place of discouragement, uh, how the devil can use discouragement, how people many times, because they are discouraged and depressed, uh, do not recognize that they are falling into a trap that is going to cause them to have much harm and damage in their spiritual life. Discouragement is never, has never, will never be of God. You need to make a little note of that. Discouragement has never, is not, and will never be of God among His people. When people are discouraged, it comes from what is happening in life around them. It is happening because the devil is either in attack mode or at least talking to them. It is happening because we have put too much affection on this world in our flesh. It's happening because our flesh, our carnal, our natural man is looking for something that is not in line with God. These are the general principles of discouragement. From time to time, people have a word of God and get discouraged, mainly because they don't understand maybe the timing of God or they don't know the will of God. But generally speaking, discouragement is something that is manufactured from the feelings of the heart of a person, a human being. God does not impute discouragement to His people. And if you have ever been discouraged, which everyone in here at one time or another has faced discouragement, you can rest assured it was not a punishment of God. It was not a judgment of God. It was not the ill will of God toward you, but it was simply what we were struggling with in your heart. Now, discouragement is really the, the, the result of despondency of perceived failures, lack of, want of. Discouragement is when you think that the waves of life are going to grind you into the coral reef until there's nothing left, and you've tried everything to be victorious, to be stabilized, to make it through, and it seems like the, 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 the powers around you are just crushing your soul. And what happens is a man or a woman begins to get discouraged discouraged. They get despondent, and they get to a place where they feel that it really doesn't matter anymore. Discouragement and, and despondency and, and, and depression oftentimes is the push that it takes to put someone over the edge to commit suicide, where someone says, I I'm just going to end my life. I can't face it any longer. I, I can't go any further. I can't deal with this problem anymore. So they take a bottle of pills, and they, they down the pills and lay down and leave a little suicide note saying, I, I couldn't deal with life, or such and such a situation overcome me. Uh, a discouragement and, 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 and despondency makes someone someone take a razor blade and, and cut their wrist and get in the bathtub and sit there and let their heart pump their life's blood out as their life ebbs away because they feel that there is no hope on the other side. I remember when I was a youth pastor, very young, uh, I remember the church received a call from one of the elder saints that had taken in a young girl from the world and was trying to help her get her life back together. And uh, the, the, the phone call was rather frantic, and, and there was no pastors around, and, and so they, it fell my lot to run over there to the house, which was a few blocks away, not really sure what we was going to find. And there in the house was a girl that had slit her wrist and was bleeding profusely as the blood was just flowing out of her arms. Now, I had never had experience with someone that was 
I've heard people talk about it. You know, I just end my life. I, I can't make it anymore. I've heard that. But I, it was my first time to get up close to someone that wasn't just talking. They was actually carrying through with their actions. And there was blood everywhere. She had gotten the bathtub for some reason. And, and, and I, maybe she read that because I'd seen, you know, in the, in the books, they said, you know, they'll get in the bathtub and, you know, relax, cut their wrist and die. And she was doing all the things that, that, that clinically are supposed to happen when someone decides to split, cut their wrist. And, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the older lady in the church was praying. She didn't know what to do. And they probably should have called an ambulance, but they called the church. And I guess that's a good thing to do. And and so uh, my cousin, Nathan Morton, a uh, pastor now, he, he came over there, and we picked this girl up and put her in the car, and we took her down to uh, a St. Joseph Hospital, and, and they was able to uh, save her life, get the, the wrist uh, sewed up, and get some blood, new blood pumped in through her through a transfusion, and she survived. When, when it was all said and done, She'd begin to, she'd be told us she'd heard these voices that had been talking to her about taking her life. And uh, these voices were telling her, you're not worth anything. Nobody cares about you. And, and you know how the story goes. And she began to feel like she didn't have any value in life. And these, these voices talked to her. Uh, there was a relationship that had went wrong that made her feel like there was no future for her. And there was no hope for her. And she had family problems. And, 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 and we didn't know any of this. She was just a street urchin off the, the streets that someone did. And it just felt so hopeless and to listen to her story, it was as if the whole world had fallen in on this young girl's head, and she had no way of going another step. And so committing suicide was the answer in her mind. I've, I've seen people that have taken a gun and blown their brains out because they couldn't face it. I, I remember being involved with a situation where a man... Uh, loaded his gun, and he, he, he just couldn't handle what was going on in his life, and he, he pulled that trigger back, and he'd put it back and forth, and he would play around with it, and finally one day he just went ahead and blew his brains out. Yeah, th this, is, this is deep, dark discouragement that gets on people. That This is where people feel like there is absolutely no way in life that this thing will turn around, this thing will change. There's no hope out there. I am in trouble, and I can't go any further. And the devil has a way. And, and if you don't believe in the devil, you you got a big surprise when you finally get a revelation that there really is a devil in his kingdom at work against you. Because they read the signs like the handwriting on the wall of people's actions and words and lifestyle to know when people are getting discouraged and they move in like a force that is invisible and speak just the right words at the right time to build the fires and to put the load and to put the gray cloud upon to make the discouragement come alive in, in, in such a way that the individual feels that I'm through. I can't go on. What's there to live for? Now, I know some of you in here, and probably most of you are saying, Pastor, I've never been that discouraged. But I have been discouraged. I've just wanted to run. I've met other people that do that. And they, they don't want to take their life, but they're so discouraged, they just want to go get in the car and drive to another city. They just want to walk out of their marriage. They just want to leave their job. They just want to uh, go to another church and get started over, hopefully, and maybe the pressures here won't follow them there. Am I preaching to anyone today? Nothing to be embarrassed about. This is the real world. I've seen people get that discouraged. I've heard them say things like that. You see, discouragement makes people say and do things that are against the Word of God. Discouragement makes people lose the purpose that God saved them and the reason God delivered them, and the ministry God gave them. I've seen people 
have situations where they believed God for something and, and God didn't come through. That is on the natural side. We, we, didn't, we don't understand God's ways. You know, God is sovereign. We do believe God answers prayer and we have faith in God. That's our job. But God does have a sovereign side where He's not going to be controlled. He's going to do what He feels is best. And, and, I, and I believe with all of my heart that when we get to heaven, there are going to be some things we're going to find out that made us discouraged here in the way God did His business there, that we're going to be running up there and hugging Him and thanking Him and telling Him, you are so good. Thank you for not doing it my way. Thank you for not letting it happen the way I thought it should have, because I couldn't see the big picture. And someone says, Pastor, what is the big picture? I don't know the big picture. I'm not God. My eyesight ain't even 2020 anymore. I just can't see that good. My mind's not as sharp as it used to be when I was younger. I just can't figure it all out. But I promise you the faith I have in God tells me that everything He does is perfect and there's no fault in Him. All that God does is righteous and is good. I think of Job who was on the, discour the, 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 the edge of discouragement and his wife walked in and she said, just commit suicide. But before you commit suicide, just blaspheme God. Just tell Him what you think of Him. Just curse Him real good because He allowed this rug to be jerked out from under. He allowed you to lose all your material goods. He allowed you to lose the loved ones in your family. And Job had enough of Job to recognize that was not of God. And he said, wife, you speak like a foolish woman. The last thing I want to do when I'm going through hell is to curse God. I don't know about you, but I sure don't want to get on the wrong side of God. I realize how much I need God when all hell breaks loose. When a prayer is not answered, when everything I've reached for falls apart and I'm hanging by a thread over the fires of hell, that's when I understand just how much I really do need Jesus. And if I can't have Jesus, there's no hope in this world. But a lot of people don't understand that. And they get discouraged lose a job and, and, and got two strong hands and say, I want to work. I want to provide for my family, but I can't find a job. I don't have this training in the fields of the jobs opening, and, and yet I have a strong back and two willing hands. And, and then they watch as, as the bill collectors send and the piles add up and their kids, they can't afford the clothing and the shoothing, uh, shoes and, and, and the groceries get thinner and, and it just seems like there's nowhere to turn. Or you care for someone you love that's sick. And instead of them getting better so you can come and shout and have a testimony, it seems that it goes south and it gets worse and worse. And that dark cloud of discouragement comes in and it blocks out the rays of sunshine. Any noise from a bird that would chirp is silenced. Uh, the green grass withers and turns brown. And you say, life is dying for me because what I want to live with and live for is not working. You see, we are the products, the descendants of a creation called humanity. And it is not new with us that in 2020 or 2021 or 2019, we would have faced discouragement. It's not something that just started happening here in this last few years of the human race. But discouragement has been taking place for thousands Ten thousands of years. I mean, discouragement is a long, long history among men and women that are human. We have the capacity to reason. 
We have the capacity to think. We have the capacity to uh, uh, try to figure out and, 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 and design and build and, and make. Uh, we're a special kind of breed of people in the world. And yet all the good that that does when discouragement gets in, we take those talents and skills and abilities that God gave us and we begin to use them to destruct instead of bring life and hope and future and a better tomorrow. And Israel is now faced with a very serious problem. You go back to chapter 13 of Numbers and chapter 14, and I won't go there for time. The Bible says that Moses sent 12 tribes into the land of Israel. This was exactly 38 and a half years earlier than what I just read you. Just a few chapters, but 38 and a half years earlier. And in 13, the spies go in, and they come back, and they tell everything that God said about Canaan. The grapes are big as grapefruits. The milk is so full of cream and rich. The honey is dripping off of every hive of every tree. The land is fertile for planting, and the water is clear for drinking. And there's plenty of stone to build solid houses. And there's already trees for shade. Oh, God didn't lie when he said it was a place of milk and honey. But after we got through looking at everything God told us, we started looking at the people and we saw giants in the land. Now, God didn't tell them to look at the giants, he told them to look at the land. We are always forever getting our eyes off of what God told us to look at. And it's no wonder that we come back discouraged because we're not looking at what we should be looking at, what God's pointed our attention to, but we're looking at everything around that's negative. And I want to tell you something, there is so much negativity in the world that I live in that if I looked at all of that, I would become so discouraged, so despondent, I, I wouldn't want to live another day. And, and, and oftentimes I'll tell them, I'm ready for the Lord Jesus to come. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I'm ready to leave this world. But I also understand till the rapture takes place, I'm not just going to crawl up and crawl under the bed in a little ball in a fetal position and shake and shimmer and just just, just, just kind of waste away. But I'm going to mount to something and do something for God and introduce the kingdom of God while I'm still in this earth. And I'm going to live a little life. And I'm going to laugh a little bit. I'm going to smile a little bit. I'm going to cry a little bit. I'm going to pray some prayers. I'm going to release hope. And I'm going to tell people when Jesus is on the throne, it's not over yet. But these people, they, 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 they looked at him, and they made a statement. In fact, let me just read it to you because I think it will help some of you today. They came back in verse 33 of chapter 13, and they said, And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which came of the giants. Now, they've mentioned giants twice. <laughs> and we were in our own sights as grasshoppers. Now, I want you to notice something. It wasn't how the enemy looked at them. It was how they looked at themselves. Did you catch that? They said, we were in our own sight. The giants didn't say, you're nothing, you're grasshoppers, you can't fight us, you can't take this land. They didn't say none of that. They just saw their size, and in their mind, their mind started working against them. And they said, in our own mind, in our own eyes, in our own thinking, we just could tell we were grasshoppers. Hey, you, you, you got to stop letting that old carnal, 
nature of fear dictating to you who and what you are in the sight of Satan. Because my Bible tells me that as many as have put on Christ. When we come to the Lord, God sees the work of Christ on us. And when you come to the devil, or you come through life and the enemy attacks, the devil sees the work of Christ in your life. And believe me, you may think that you're not much in this world. The devil has no false illusions about you. He has seen the weakest Christian get a little lightning bolt of faith hit their soul. He's seen them drop to their knees in situations that were absolutely helpless and heard the cry as it rose up from the soul and ascended into the heavens before the throne of God by faith. Uh, he's seen God stand at attention to a weakened saint that couldn't normally have put a dent in his kingdom and give an order that made the heavens reverberate as the angels went into action to answer a prayer. It's foolish to allow what we see to dictate who we are when God has ordered of us take the land. They said we're grasshoppers and so we were in their sights. You see, because I think I'm this, the world thinks I'm this. That, that's in essence what they said. I think I'm a grasshopper so they, they think I'm a grasshopper. Well, I got a question. Why did they shut themselves up in a city and hide for seven days if they were the giants and we're the little small guys? Well, why didn't they just march on over and just wipe us out? Because there were too many stories of victory that when they walked into their land, there was a tally. Yeah, they lost some battles. They lost, they had some prisoners. They had some people that were captured. But the overall story of the people of Israel was, we remember something that happened in the past. We know that you may not be as much as we are on the natural plane, but our gods are not comparable to your singular God. Aren't you the people where the Red Sea rolled back? Aren't you the people that God led out of Egypt from the mightiest nation in the world and set you free? You, you see, we can't allow ourselves to see ourselves like that. Now, let's go to chapter 14. And all the congregation, they got discouraged. That's what's happening. They lifted up their voice and cried. And the people wept that night. In other words, everything God promised us is a lie. Everything God said is false. We can't take the land. There's enemies that will destroy us. God, you let us out of Egypt to face this people. And the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in the wilderness? You, you better be careful what you ask God for. Because that group did die in the wilderness. God answered their prayer. Would God we had died in Egypt under the slave whip. Would God we died in this wilderness. But oh, having to face those giants. And God said, you want to die in the wilderness? You will die in the wilderness. But I want to tell you something. Discouragement affects your mouth. Now, I read to you 38 and a half years later where the way, the journey made them discouraged and they spoke against God and they spoke against Moses. The man of God and the God that the man of God represented. Now here, they're speaking against the priest. They're speaking against Moses. They're murmuring against it. If you're not careful, you will say things that will hurt and damage 
the miraculous that God wants to bring to you. You have to be careful. And one of the best things you can do when you get discouraged, everybody deals with it differently. I'm going to tell you how I deal with it. When I get discouraged, I just shut up. Because I don't want to say something that I have to go back and try and straighten out with God or with somebody later on. Some people, when they get discouraged, they make a royal mess of life in relationships with people. They run off at the mouth. They snap at people. They just explode and just let it all out. And they get angry with God and they go in prayer. You know what? That doesn't do you any good because you are snared with the words of your mouth. Discouragement has the ability to make you say things that will make you a prisoner to places you don't want to be bound to. And so the best thing to do when you get discouraged is don't say anything, but go to the Word and start thinking about what God said in your mind. And start encouraging yourself in the Lord. And start letting God put faith where faithlessness has reigned. Let God put hope where hopelessness has been present. And start believing until you can get to the place when you do open your mouth, you can say something that's worthwhile. And you won't say to God we died in Egypt and to God we died in the wilderness, but you can say we are well able to go up and take the land. I refuse to be discouraged. And so here we find in this story, it says, verse 3, And wherefore hath God brought us into the land to fall by the sword of our Uh, that our wives and our children should be a prey, were it not better for us to remain or return to Egypt? And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return unto Egypt. Now I have met people. You see, Egypt's a type of the world. The journey from Egypt to Canaan is the process of coming out of Egypt. Canaan is like being in the church. Oh, some of you think it means being in heaven, but it's not because in heaven there's no more battles to fight. (laughs) There's no more working the sweat of the brow to make it live. There's no more breaking the law and being judged. And they got all that in Canaan, even when they become a nation. It's a type of living in the church when you've come out of Egypt. And these people are on their way to a place of serenity in life where God's going to put them. And they start saying, let's get rid of the preacher. Let's get rid of the leader. Let's get us a new leader and have him take us back to the world. We want to be slaves. We want to be in bondage. We want to build the kingdoms of a pharaoh. We want to serve another people. We don't want the promises of God. Do you know I've met people that have said just about the exact same thing in modern terms? When I was living for the devil and I was in the world, it was never like this. But it seems like ever since I became a Christian, I've had to fight hell, and I've had to do this, and I've had to do that. It's easier not being a Christian. And I will tell you some of the stuff I've heard because it almost be blasphemy, but I have literally heard people that want to go back to the world or talk about the world with some kind of fondness as if it was a place or an oasis for their soul. You see, discouragement makes you think wrong. It makes you talk wrong. It makes you perceive wrong. It makes you act wrong. But thank God there are people that are like Joshua. (laughs) Verse 6 says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of them that searched the land, rent their clothes, And they spake unto all the company of the children of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to search it is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delight in us, then we, He will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which floweth with milk and honey. Only rebel not against the Lord, neither fear ye the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their defense is departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Fear them not. Twelve went over, but only two could see what God could do, and ten saw what the flesh was going to do. 
And the Bible says in this passage that I read to you, verse 4, it says, and the soul of the people was much discouraged. And here's the reason. Because of the way or because of the journey. You see, 38 and a half years, they've been out in the wilderness. They brought it on themselves. They're not supposed to go into Canaan. They're not supposed to have hope. But they get in a battle, and the battle is very severe, and they pray to God, and God says, I'm going to have mercy and let you have, start having the victories right now before you get over there. And they start winning a battle until they totally conquer the kings of this nation and the leaders and the princes and the people, and they walk away with a great victory. Soon as they come out of that battle, they sit down and, and begin to contemplate and think, and they get discouraged, and they get depressed. And the Bible says that the journey made them discouraged. Now, you've got to understand this. Christianity from the world to the other side has a lot of discouragement. I don't know anyone that has lived the good Christian faith, walked the good Christian walk, that could stand up in an honest voice and declare that they've never had a trial, that they've never had the enemy try to stop them, that they haven't had some disappointments in life, that they haven't had failures in this world. People that talk like that aren't being truthful, or they got a little mental issue going on in here and they can't process properly. Because anybody that can process properly knows that it is a fight of faith. And there are oppositions, and there are mountains to climb, and there are fires to go through, and there are times where you look the lion in the mouth and wonder if he's going to rip your head off. And you get discouraged with your own failures and your own shortcomings. And so when we live for God, the way of the journey oftentimes has the ability to make people lose faith and sight in God. Much like when Peter got out of the boat, the Bible says that he was doing fine. He was walking on the water. I don't know how far out Christ was, but obviously he got out and he took some steps on the water, but he got his eyes off Jesus and started looking at the winds, and obviously he can't see wind, so he was looking what the wind was doing, and when he got to looking at what the wind was doing, he put more confidence in the power of the wind than he did in the man that said, come, and he started sinking, but his redeeming factor was he knew who to call on he said, Lord, have mercy on me. Save me. And the Lord reached out and picked him up by the hand, and together they walked by, back to the boat. I want to tell you that you are going to face things in life that is going to do everything it can to steal your faith and to cause you to become discouraged because the devil cannot do one thing against you except, except, and I love this, Use his voice. You see, if the devil wanted to kill Nathaniel and God allowed him to just do what he wanted to do, I'd be dead. He's had several chances. I've even helped him out a few times, put myself in some bad situations. And it's like the Lord never let him do it. I would say that you living for God, if Satan could wipe you out today, you would be through. It'd be like a mass suicide in here. It'd be like a mass uh, uh, killing in here. I mean, people, the devil just come in here and wipe us all out. You got to realize that he's got boundaries. You got to realize that he's got a hedge that he can't get through. You got to realize he has to present himself before the God of all creation and ask permission before he can do anything to you. And I know Christians don't believe that. I know people that are supposed to be Christians say, no, the devil doesn't have that. God doesn't. I remember there was a, a great Bible teacher used to make a, he'd always drive this point home. We don't have a hedge of protection around us. That's the most stupid thing you ever heard because I know good and well I can't fight a spirit on another dimension that wants to destroy me. But with the Holy Ghost in me... <laughs> Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And we get discouraged. And the devil whispers. Now when you look at 
Michael, every time you see him, he is fighting. He's got a big old sword. He was designed for war. But when you look at Satan, the only thing that he was given that he has been able to use is the Bible says that he was a beautiful angel. And he was created with a symphony, the pipes. These were old ancient instruments that they would have when they brought together, like we would say, the big band or the big orchestra. These were the orchestra uh, uh, instruments that they used of that era of time in the description of Satan. The Bible says the tabards. Those are different types of drums and different types of flutes and pipes were put inside. And when he spoke, it was like a musical. It, it just kind of, it, it is like sung out. It was, it, it was something else. Now, when he was cast out of heaven, he didn't lose his voice. You see, everything about him is voice activated, and he fights with his voice. I watch him when he comes before God in the book of Job. God says, have you? And he says, if you do this and you do this. In other words, I can't do anything. He's the father of lies. He started telling lies because he learned that was the only power he had was his voice. He didn't have a sword, so he just had to learn to get people to self-destruct and people to speak against themselves. I watch when we're in Revelation chapter 12, he goes up and he is the accuser of the brethren. But we have already overcome him by the blood of the Lamb and the testimony of what God did for us. And so this devil uses his voice, and what he does, he brings evil imaginations. He brings thoughts to our hearts and our minds, and he speaks things in there sometimes so soft and so gentle that it mimics the thought pattern of the human brain. And it's so close in alignment to what the human thought pattern is like that we just accept it as it's being fed into our brain, thinking that we're thinking these thoughts. And in thinking these thoughts, we're oftentimes embracing them or at least know they're wrong, but taking a little time to enjoy them and chew on them and meditate on them and fantasize on them. And then we kind of catch yourself, that's wrong, i got to get rid of that. And, and then we go through it again and we bring it back and, and it comes and the devil keeps talking to us. And when we get into warfare... Paul says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And he gives a list and he says, put on the whole armor. If you look at the armor, it's all protective things against a powerless devil that wants to speak his destruction into your heart. In Corinthians chapter uh, 2 uh, Corinthians 10, it says, casting down every evil imagination that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Well, where does that imagination, where does that thought, where does that philosophy, where does that argument come from? It comes from a voice. I remember years ago, in a Pentecostal service, got really wild, there was this nutcase in there. And he drew an invisible imaginary sword, and he was having this sword fight with this invisible angel as he fought the devil off. And boy, he got a lot of attention, and, and all the sensational people said, no, he's in the spirit, this, that, or the other. And I remember I went up and talked to him. I said, who are you fighting with that? He said, I'm fighting the devil. I said, the devil don't have a sword. How, how are you fighting the devil? He ain't got a sword. He's got a voice. Michael has the sword. And if you've got an angel with a sword trying to wipe you out, that means God's after you, not the devil. All the devil can do is tell you lies and speak evil into your mind. And if you're dumb enough to believe that, he can get you to do anything he wants you to. But if you can say, you know what, that don't line up to the Word of God. Uh, that don't line up to what God says. Uh, that don't line up to what thus saith the Lord. Yeah. 
when I wrestle against the devil, I'm wrestling in my mind. I'm wrestling in prayers. I'm wrestling against the lies that he's speaking to other people out there. Yes, they may have physical actions and there may be physical consequences, but it all starts with a voice. And these people in this journey, they got so discouraged. It seemed like all hell broke loose. And it was one thing after another. And it seems like they couldn't get any victory. But here's what they failed to realize. They had a promise of deliverance from Egypt. And before they got to this place in the journey... There was a man God raised up by the name of Moses that put a rod out over the water and separated the Red Sea to one side to the other. And a wind blew and put a dry path that they crossed over on. And then when they got to the other side, the angel of the Lord raised up and allowed the light to replace the darkness that held the enemy at bay. And then they came in path to follow them, to destroy them. And the Bible says God spoke and said, Moses, put your rod out. And he put his rod out. And those giant walls just came right back down and destroyed that enemy. Now, I'm telling you, that is an incredible beginning of getting out of Egypt. And when you got saved, you had a similar experience with God. I don't care how far in sin you were, how bound in the world you were, how many scars and how much baggage you have. When you repented of your sins and went to the water in Jesus' name, when you come through the water, the devil couldn't come any further after you. Oh, yes, sir. You went through the water and the Lord put the waters back down and said, that is it. They have been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of my dear son, the kingdom of light. Well, pastor, why are we still fighting giants? Because you're still living in the flesh. When the fighting stops is when you die. When the fighting stops is when you leave this earth and you stand before the Lord. But until you get to that place of death in the body or the resurrection of the body, whichever comes first, you are going to face some battles and have some giants. They're, they're, they're fighting giants here. They go 38 years later, they still have giants. I'm going to tell you, there's always been opposition to God's people getting what God promised them. And there's always been people that have been lost as the casualties of war. And there's been saints that have been discouraged. We cannot allow that to tell us who God is and what God is and what God will do and what the Word will do. I've made this statement a lot of times and and I think it would be a good place to make it again. My body... And my life and the world I live in does not commentary and translate and explain the Word of God. The Word of God stands alone. There's been times where I have been sick unto death. And I didn't receive the miraculous miracle. That doesn't mean that God's Word is not true. And because I had an experience, it aborts what God has said. Now, I know that's, that's really tough for some people, but I'm going to tell you, I've said this for 30 years, and I will say it to the day I die or the day the Lord takes me home. There is no mortal that can dictate and explain away what God has said. And you got to get that kind of bulldog faith that bites on to God's Word and says, God, I don't understand it. I don't understand why this happened. I don't understand why why this prayer wasn't answered, but I believe your word and you are going to see me through, my family through, and the people I love through, and the church through. We laid hands on my father in that hospital less than 12 hours before he died with a big old tumor in his brain. And we prayed an apostolic prayer for several hours. The nurses just left us alone and we prayed and prayed and prayed. We felt God in a mighty way. We were weeping and crying and speaking in tongues and I believe the angels of God had already come into that room because I felt them in there. And I mean, we just had us a meeting. It just seemed like for sure any moment his eyes were going to flutter, pull that tube out and everything was going to be fine. 
And 12 hours later, he passed away. I'm going to tell you something. I love my father. And if my father were here, he could tell you from the other side. But his death does not negate that by his stripes we were healed. His death does not say that because he died, all of God's word is not true. But we realize this is one of the battles of the many battles in life that we fight. Uh, but we keep going forward and we keep believing and we keep trusting, knowing that God is still on the throne and that God is still victorious. And we're going to keep praying for the sick. Uh, we're going to keep praying for miracles. We're going to pray for the deliverance because he is well able. You see, discouragement is normal. Discouragement is something that happens to everybody. But if you're not careful, discouragement will alter the way you talk and think. And these people, every time they got discouraged, every time they saw something with their eyes, they immediately started talking against the preacher, started talking about the man of God, started talking about God, started talking about those that stood with the man of God. You got to make a decision. Are you on the Lord's side? Or are you on the world's side? Do you really want to go back to Egypt? Do you really want to become an alcoholic again? Do you really want to be a prostitute on the street? Do you really want to be that greedy man whose family can't stand him? Do you really want to be the party and the bar hopper? Worry about every time you have sex you get some kind of disease. Do you really want to be that lonely person that's shut up in your house wishing there was something else because you're so depressed because you don't have any life and you're not living any life? And that's what the world brought most of you out of. Guilt and shame and discouragement. And yet you get discouraged over a little battle in the church and you're ready to walk away from it and go back to hell. And go back to the bondage of Satan. I don't know about you, but anything the world has to offer, it don't even begin to compete with my worst day as a child of God. I know it's not perfect as a child of God. Last week on, on Saturday, I had a kidney stone, and I prayed God delivered me, and I had to go to the hospital. I had to get some medicine pumped in me. But that don't change the fact that I'm back in church as soon as I get the opportunity to be. It don't change the fact that I still believe God's the most wonderful thing in the world. It don't change the fact that there's nobody like Jesus. Uh, bring the giants on. Uh, I will not fear, for greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. We are the people of God. We are the people of God. We are the people of victory. And no, I'm not heartless and I don't just ignore it and act like it doesn't exist. I'm not Christian science and where they just, you know, it's only in your mind. No, I know that pain is real. I know that death is real. I know that emotions and tearful and saying goodbyes is hard. I know that. I know that looking for work and not being able to find it and losing a home, I know that's real and that hurts. I know that divorce hurts. I know that having a child that is addicted and a child that's in drugs and a child that's living in the world, I know that's real. That's not fake. We're not saying that that doesn't exist. But what we're saying is there is a God that is bigger than the problem. There is a God that is greater than the giant. There is a God that loves you and cares for you and gave his life for you and delivered you from sin because he cared for you. And I got something the world don't have. One of these days, I'm going to go to heaven. And I'm going to see Kenneth Franklin Haney, whose prayer wasn't answered here, but's made whole there. You see, the world can't take that from me. You see, when they lose their loved ones, it's finality. It's over because they don't have a better tomorrow. They don't have a hope of eternity. But when you die in Christ, it's not the end of the road. It's the beginning of a future that's bright and glorious in Christ Jesus.
And these people, they just had victory. They had a promise of deliverance, and God kept that promise. But that wasn't the only promise that they had. They had a promise of the future. Why is it that when the enemy speaks into our minds, we become so despondent and overwhelmed and discouraged that we cannot see the greater good that God is doing? They said, there's no bread out here. There's no water out here. There's no shelter out here. I mean, when you get discouraged, you'll tell lies on God that you never realize you're telling. There was just a rock a few feet behind some of them that were saying there's no water that was just putting out a river of water. No water out here, and that water just passing them by. There's no bread out here. And they just got a, a, a little bucket full of fresh bread from the manna that fell that morning. Read it. It's in the Bible. The preacher, he's a liar. He preaches one thing and, and says God this, and it's, it doesn't happen. And at night they had a pillar of fire that gave them light. And in the day a cloud came over and kept the sun from scorching them. And he taught them the Word of God. And he gave them the Ten Commandments. And he gave them the law that they might know God as a school teacher that leads them to Christ. But the discouragement made them say things that were not true. Discouragement made them think things that were a lie from hell. And it got so bad that they said, I just want to give up. I just, I don't care. I could see the promised land. I know there's big grapes and I know there's milk and honey and there's orchards that are already planted and there's cities for the taking. And, and, and I just don't care. I just want to go back and say, put the cuffs back on me. Put the fetters back on my feet. Take my shirt off and beat my back and make me get up in the morning and build brick for your pyramids and your cities and your storehouses. Destroy my life. Let me die a slave. Let me die in, in a place where I don't have any say-so in life. You see, when you're discouraged, you don't think right. And they said, would to God we were back in Egypt. Don't you remember how the world treated you? Don't you remember how it was when Pharaoh had his way in your life? It's only 11.07. I'm usually about 10 till 7 or 10 till 12 when we get to this part of the sermon. So we're a good 40 minutes ahead. But somebody is going to be a Joshua. Somebody is going to be a Caleb. Somebody is going to be a Levite. Somebody is going to be a man or a woman of faith. It's going to say, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I know what God's done in the past. I assume it's going to happen in the future. But if somehow between here and there, I will not throw away my faith in the Word of God, but I will hold on to the Lord's unchanging hand. I'm telling you, the devil has done everything he can to discourage the church in 2020. He's organized it through pestilence that we couldn't have church. And God took what they meant for evil and made good, and many of us became stronger in the Lord to the demise and the dismay of Satan. But some people were like the seed that was sown on the stony ground, and they sprung up, but they didn't have any root, and so they were carried away. The devil is tried over and over. There has been sicknesses, and there has been diseases. There's been marriage problems. 
But we've, we've had these before, but we have them again. There's been backslidings. And obviously I'm preaching to people that have faith or you wouldn't be here this morning. But in the general circles that we run, we've had a lot of setbacks, so to speak. And the devil's spoken into our hearts and our minds. And then it's been on the world scene. It's been having a government that's, that's, that's messed up in the head. We got legislation that keeps being pushed through that's heavier and heavier perversions and oppression and more against God's Word, more against God's saying. And the devil screams in our ear and says, you guys are losing. Now, if you want to believe the devil, you can do that. As an American, as a human being, you have the freedom of free choice. But I will tell you this. You're barking up the wrong tree if you start putting that and peddling that on my doorstep. Because I remember a story many years ago that I learned in Sunday school called Noah and the Flood. And Noah is a type of the day and age we live in. And Jesus said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. And the story goes something like this for you that have never heard it. <clears throat> the whole earth was filled with violence. Does that sound familiar? Man's imagination was only evil continually. Does that sound familiar? And Noah preached righteousness for a hundred years. And his soul was vexed by the unrighteousness and the evil in the land. And between preaching and building a boat where there was no lake to float, no ocean to put it in, no rivers to let it go down to a larger body. He just kept building based on one thing. Thus saith the Lord. Are you building on thus saith the Lord or are you building on what your eyes take in around you? And one day God said, the boat's finished, Noah. And a lot of people say, even the Jews, and, and I've, I've talked with many of my Jewish friends about this because the rabbis say Noah was a failure because he didn't save the world. How wrong they are. This is where I greatly depart from the Jewish theology. <laughs> Noah walked in that boat with a male and a female of every animal. His son and his daughter-in-laws went into that boat. His wife went into the boat. He went into that boat. Everything that was in that boat was the next world that lit, was going to live. He walked in the total, you've heard me say this, but i got to say it again. He walked in the minority of society, the outcast of the heathen, the man they made fun of, and the ones they looked at as some crazy nut because he believed he heard from God. But 364 days later and a half of another day, by the calculations that I have, the door came open and the plank came down. And when he walked out into the world, he was the full and absolute majority. And I want to tell you, there's coming a day where King Jesus is going to set his throne up and you that have built the house on the rock and refuse to be discouraged by what you have heard and what you have seen and what this world has thrown at you. You're going to be in the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. You're going to rule and you're going to reign with the Lord. And while you may think you're in the minority, you're really not. For there are more with us than there are that be with them. Heaven has never been outnumbered. But if you can't fathom that, then let me simply put it like this. One man with God is always the majority. 
Oh, Noah, he had something there. So, devil, you can tell me all the lies you want. I'm not going to listen to them. I'm not going to embrace them. I'm not going to receive them. I'm not going to believe them. I'm not going to think on them. Every lie you tell me, I'm going to rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I'm going to get in that book, and I'm going to read the promises of God. I'm going to read the story of Jesus. I am going to live according to thus saith the Lord. I came out of Egypt, that was absolute. I came out of the bondage of sin, that was absolute. I got, I, that, that's something you can't tell me didn't happen. I got the Holy Ghost in me. You, you can't tell me that's just emotion. I've prayed in it too many times. Had its comforting spirit touch me too many times. And so anything you tell me about my future that he said... It ain't worth the time to discuss it, to argue it, or even think about it. Because what he said he would do for others, he did for me. And one of these days, there's going to be a trumpet sound so loud as they say it will rake up the dead, and the dead in Christ will rise up. And so shall we ever be with the Lord my question is, why would you be discouraged? It's the voices that you listen to and the words you meditate on. But if you'll think on Him, you'll think on Him. And in closing, I want to read a verse out of Philippians today. Our music would get ready. I feel God has spoken to many, many people today. I feel God has been talking to us. I understand that discouragement is real. I know that it's real. I understand that things that happen in life are absolutely real. But there's something more real than the tangible, and that's Jesus and His Spirit and His Word that speaks into our lives. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We got to get to their church. Headlines come on. This happened. Someone tells you this piece of bad news. Something gets real close and hits you in the home. Well, what are you going to do? Rejoice. Worship. Give thanks. How do you deal with problems? I thank you, Jesus. But, but what do you do about this? It hurts too much. I trust you, Lord. I worship you. I still believe in you. I can't explain it, and I hurt like hell inside, but I haven't lost my faith in you, and I want to still serve you, and I want to keep walking with you. you got to know how to talk to God. Well, if that happened to me, I, I, would just, I would just lose it. Not if you really get a visual of who Jesus is. You can keep it together. It may be through stammering lips and tears and, and I don't understand, but there will also be I still love you. I still believe you. I still trust you. I haven't given up on you. I can't explain this and it hurts in here, but I know you're real. Let your moderation, let the balance of your life, let, let the way you do things. Don't be one of these that have these big swings. You know, some people, when everything's going good, you'd think they won a million dollars at a gambling table. 
They stand on their head, they scream, they yell, they, they're so excited that when things go bad, you'd think they just lost a million dollars and plus everything else they have, and they are so depressed. God wants Christians to be balanced and have an even keel and, and face the journey. It's important. Now, this next verse, it says, and the peace of God. What would we do if we didn't have the peace? What would we do if we didn't have that spirit of peace that passeth all understanding, that holds us together in the middle of the storm, which passeth? In other words, you will not always understand it, but you'll have such peace from God that's been divinely imputed into you that that peace is stronger than your lack of understanding of why you're going through what you're going through or facing what you're facing. She'll keep your hearts. That word keep there is the very word we use for the garrison that guards, is ordered to guard. It'll guard your heart. So it's not just keeping it like we're going to keep it for you till you come back. But they're literally got a guard up. The, God's peace guards your heart from the attacks of the enemy and the words and, that speak into your mind through Jesus Christ. Now, I read this to you a couple of weeks ago, and I think we should be reading it a lot more than just on Sunday morning. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, this is the list of things to think on this week. I want you to take your Bible out this week, and every time something attacks your mind, it, I want you to see if it fits in this category. Whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Any veteran child of God knows that's the list of meditating. That's the list of things you got to. And it didn't just say, someone says, well, it's true. But you got to keep reading the verse. Is there any virtue in that truth? Some things are true, but they're not good to think on. The world's going to hell. That's true. There's rapists in our city. That's true. There's child molesters in our city. There's people being killed in our city. That is true, but there's no virtue in it. The key is, does it have virtue? You see, what, what brings virtue to my soul? If there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, something I can praise the Lord, something I can worship God for, think on these things. Praise God. Church, we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. We are more than victors through Christ who cared for us and saved us. We are the people of the Most High God. Let not your soul be discouraged in the journey of life. But if He brought you out of the world, He's going to take you to a new world. And He's going to keep you and sustain you in the journey from this world to that place on the other side. Amen. Let's stand if we would. Praise the Lord. We're going to pray here in just a moment, but before we pray, I want to admonish you with one thing. You are a creature of the finest of God's creation that has the ability to choose. 
Very few, if any other, have such choices, at least in the conscious way that we do. If you choose to let it into your heart and your mind, you made the choice, not God. But you can also choose to say that is going to have to sit over here because I don't have room for it with all the other stuff. I want to be here. Make the right choice and think on the things that are pure, the things that are righteous, the things that are wholesome, the things that are good. I can't, as a pastor, choose for you. I can't control your destiny. I can't take care or remove trials and hardships that you're going through. If I could, I would, but I don't have that power. I've got my own battles. I've got my own mind to work with this week. But together we can think on the things that have virtue. Church, if we ever needed to do this, we need to do it today. And I want you to lay hands on family members right now. And I want you to pray for them. And I want you to ask God to help us to overcome the thing that so easily besets us and causes us to be discouraged. There are people in here today, they desperately need to be set free from discouragement. You look good. You smile good. You're even dressed nice. But your heart's not in line with what your outward appearance is. I sense the discouragement. I sense some of the depression. That's why God gave me this message today. But I want you to pray against them. I want you to pray God will put the Holy Ghost so strong in them. I want you to pray God will anoint them. God will enable them. God will help them to get control of the thought pattern. Because if you can get control of your mind, you've got control of your life. If you get control of your mind, you've got control of your life. Not everything in it, but you control the outcome of life by what you control in here. Let's pray a moment. We're going to pray a couple prayers. Let's pray this one first. Lord Jesus, today, I pray that you would anoint your people today. Anoint our minds and enable us, God, to control the things that have been in here. Let the Scripture manifest powerfully within our hearts uh, and the virtue of the Lord to flow in our spirits, God, through our minds, through our thinking capacity, God. To cause us, O oh Lord, to be victorious in the thought pattern of our hearts today. God, let us think on the Word of God. Let us desire the things of God. Let us desire the voice of God and the written Word of God that we might think on those things that bring the virtue into our spirits and our life. If you're, if you're dealing with things in your mind, I want you to rebuke it in the name of Jesus right now. I want you to say, I rebuke that thought. I rebuke those voices. I refuse to allow them to speak into my mind right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Come on, I want you to rebuke it right now. If you've been dealing with voices, I want you to talk to it in Jesus' name. Say, you cannot speak. I will not listen. I will not allow. I rebuke it in Jesus' name. Hilobo sotora sikilia sataya la bahata. God, touch our mind with your spirit. Touch our mind with your presence today. Let the breath of God breathe upon us today. Infuse hope into us. Uh, infuse hope into us. Uh, let the hope of God rise with wings in our heart today. 
Ikala bahasha taya na la bohora hasata. Ilobo soto rasi kilio sata ya na la bahata. For the battle, for the battle. 